would just stand with me, please? I might need just a little more. Can you hear me in the back back there? They can hear me. Okay. I guess that's fine with me then. 477. 477. Good to see everybody tonight. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Let's sing the first, the third, and the last verse here. We get started with our service tonight. 477. <laughs> Father, again, we thank you, Lord, <clears throat> for the opportunity to be in your house tonight, Lord. We just thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you Lord, for all that you do for us, how you take care of us and other needs. We just praise you for that. Just pray, Lord, you're blessed tonight in the service. Just ask you, Lord, you'll be with the Beaches and the Millers as they travel. Just pray that you watch over them, keep them safe, be with the vehicles. Lord, again, we just praise you. Just bless tonight. Be with Pastor. That you'll use him. Speak to our hearts in your precious name. We pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. For our next song, let's go to number 59, if you would, please. Number 59. I sing the mighty power of God. All three verses. Number five, now. Oh 
visitation, of course, on Saturday at 10 a.m. Churchwide visitation, the 18th and 21st is the Ladies Banquet, as was mentioned this morning. Ladies have uh, some more information if you want it in the foyer and a sign-up sheet out there. And uh, if you didn't grab one this, this uh, morning and you're an uh, 18 and over lady, you can certainly <coughs> grab the giveaway that we had this morning for Mother's Day. We'll uh, uh, cycle one out there for you. Uh, but the 21st, 6 p.m., Ladies' Banquet, and then on the 24th, Family Game Night, Friday night, and uh, so not this week, but the following week, the, uh, the 24th, 5.30 p.m., there's food, fellowship, terrific time, volleyball, and different activities there. And then the 28th, the following Tuesday, is the Prime Timers activity at 12 p.m. We'll meet at Little Hawking Park and have a good time of fellowship out there, a little picnic and such. All right, let's do another song, 449, 449, if you would please. Must Jesus bear the cross alone, 449? <laughs> stay in the van. For all the good ones, he decided to stay in the van, right? But I got out and just, you know, struck up the conversation with him. Hey, you know, from the church. And I just, hey, I'd love to share this with you. It takes me about eight or ten minutes or so. He's like, okay. You know, and so sometimes, you know, it takes you back. It takes you back because you got a lot of people out here. Oh, they're busy. you got stuff to do. Uh, last week, our last one we went to, this driveway was just rocky and crazy. I mean, I finally just stopped the SUV and said, we're going to walk. <laughs> Um, so we walk up this big hill, and we get up there, and we can tell, well, these are some of those houses you feel embarrassed for somebody that you're walking by, all of their junk and their stuff is out, you know, on, on the per uh, porch and everything, you know. They weren't expecting anybody to come by and walk up there and visit them, not, not for two seconds, right? But I'm like, well, we're here, knock on the door. And he's just like, what are you guys doing here? You know, we don't, we don't like, we, you know, there's a reason why we live out here in the woods like this or something like that, you know, like, go, let me get out of here, you know. I kind of started looking up his driveway to make sure there wasn't another house over the side. Like, what are you doing? I'm <laughs> just like, I'm just checking over there to see if there was another house. Like, get out of here, you know. 
So he was sitting there playing a video game, very, very busy. You could tell he was playing a video game, you know. So some people will be that way. But then I met Isaiah yesterday, and he's just like, yeah, these are friendly. He's just, yeah, go ahead. You can tell me, you know. And I told it to him, you know. And I asked, you know, is that something that somebody showed you before? And he goes, no, not really. There's people out there who haven't been shown the gospel. And uh, he was just open to it. I was talking to him. Sure, go ahead. Share it to me, you know. And uh, he received Christ as Savior, prayed with him. And, and uh, so hopefully, maybe we'll see him. I don't know. But I think the majority of the people out there like that, you're not going to see him in church. That's just the reality. Uh, Jesus had, you know, multitudes and multitudes and multitudes, you know, with all the apostles and everybody they reached. And after he got crucified, of course, there was a lot of politics there and fear. He just got killed. But they got to the upper room and there's 120 people there. That's the people that came and came faithfully, got to learn everything and, and were discipled. And so, but uh, praise the Lord, we're going to meet every single one of those people in heaven. Every single one of them. So, well, Dave, go ahead. Well, uh, it's not that dramatic, but uh, <laughs> I uh, prepared some ground this year, planted some seed. The Lord watered, the Lord brought the sunshine. That, that corn and those beans are growing. And he watered again, and he watered again, and watered again. So I'm thankful for that. Uh, it didn't rock the ground. He let it grow. And it's all the Lord's. Once it's in the ground, it's his ground. And I'm giving him the praise. Well, it started as his, too. He created the original beans and everything in the world. Amen. This is my Father's world. Praise the Lord. He lets us use it for his glory. Well, let's sing a chorus here. Uh, 220, 282. 282. The family of God. 282. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Four, five, seven.
it's very blessing. I like that. Let's do Psalm 61 too in your Bibles. Psalm 61. Put this one the music with our camp. Psalm 61. And verse 2. Uh, I gotta find it. Verse 2. There it is. From the end of the earth. Alright, we'll start. Here we go. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. Exodus chapter 17. So we move closer to Mount Sinai here. We cross the Red Sea. We've been to Elam. The children of Israel are out of Egypt. There's a big, huge crowd of them, maybe something like 2 million people moving through an uh, inhospitable uh, territory. There's not uh, the ability to, to live there indefinitely, right? If there's no family who would say, hey, here's a place for us to live. There's not a good water source and there's not a good uh, way for you to be able to you know, plant crops or build anything, grow anything. And so uh, the temperature is being regulated by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. The people now have food after chapter 16. It just starts falling out of the sky every morning for them. And we continue following, leading the Lord through the wilderness, through the lands that would not be habitable were it not for the supernatural workings of the hand of God. And God is doing all sorts of miracles to take care of them. He says, I, I would bear you up on eagle's wings. I bent over backwards, right? And did huge miracles to do, to do all the work for you. If you're, if, you're, if you're riding on the back of an eagle, he's doing all the work, right? That's the, that's the metaphor there. God's doing all the work for the people. So therefore, the people are learning to trust the Lord. And they're learning to follow directions. They're learning to follow the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord. When God says, hey, don't, don't go out and get the manna on the seventh day. There's not going to be any out there. Some people trickle out there and they look around and they say, yeah, sure enough. I guess we'll just next week we'll just sleep in. We'll just rest like we're supposed to. And the people are follow, learning to follow the commandments of God and fear the Lord. Let's pray. We'll get into chapter 17. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, these, uh, the testimony of these people right here, the record of these people and their examples. There are some bad examples that we've seen, people that get testy and people that get dirty and nasty um, with the man of God and with uh, the people who've been helping them and, and supplying their every need. And uh, those other people that have a gracious heart with the Lord and decide to follow the Lord and decide to obey the Lord and decide to do as they're told to do what they're supposed to do. And I pray that you'd help us to pick up on those through the Spirit, that we would have the good examples and we would keep and follow the good examples in our minds and hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter 17, and all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So as I alluded to last week, God is giving a high level of care for the Israelites in so many areas. And just a few minutes ago, of course, and he later, you know, says at this time, I bear you up on eagles' wings with all the care, taking care of the Israelites. But at this moment, they're out of water. They don't have a water source. Verse 2, wherefore the people did chide with Moses and with and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide you with me? Wherefore tempt ye the Lord. So they chided with him. In other words, this doesn't make sense right now. God's been caring for us. God's been meeting all of our needs. Why are you being disrespectful to the Lord's man right now and chiding with me? To chide means to scold or rebuke. That's another some, some similar words for it. Uh, one, another meaning it could mean to find fault with, to voice disapproval to. That's what the chide means. Why are you chiding with authority right now? And then he says that amounts to tempting the Lord. I think there we see sometimes when the Bible says tempting the Lord, it just means that you're doing something that you know is wrong or unwise because, hey, we know that there, you know, might be consequences. We know that God also is sometimes merciful and gracious. 
And so we're going to, I'm going to keep on doing something sinful just because I feel like it. And so that amounts to tempting the Lord. Something sinful like scolding and finding fault with the man of God. Now, let me just say, there is a right way to come to a, a bishop, a pastor, a minister, a man of God. If you have something that you feel needs to be addressed, that's wonderful. That, that's a wonderful thing for people to do. It says in 1 Timothy 6, 1, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. So entreating and rebuking are two totally different things, right? To entreat somebody is, is uh, to, to come to them very kindly and respectfully and say, hey, listen, you know, I want to talk to you about this. I think things might be able to be made better. Maybe we could work on something here. Just like you would to your father, right? It's not right for you to go to your father and say, What are you doing with the, this whole crowd? You're gonna just just gonna thirst them to death? Did you bring them out here so that you can kill them all? Well, is there not enough graves over there in the room? That's that's not how you talk to your dad, right? You, you and your dad have something going wrong. You know, maybe he could improve something, maybe he could work on something, right? You come to it nicely and say, Hey, listen, hey, I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I want to address something. I think the whole family could be benefited. I think we can improve the situation for it, right? There's, there's a different way of talking. And the way that you come to people obviously matters and is important. And so we're not saying here that the people should have just done nothing. Here their kids are. They're getting very thirsty. They have no water. starting to get dicey, you know, and uh, starting to get the point of, hey, we're, where's the next water source that we're planning on coming to here? Is there going to be one in the next few hours? It's just important that the people should have come in a respectful manner. Hey, listen, you know, we're going to need water soon. Can we help in some way? Do we need to get together and make a decision here? Do we need to send out some scouts and try to figure out where a location is where there might be a water source? But that's not what they said, right? They come out with viciousness and they criticize and it's just, well, look at verse number three where it tells you about it. And the people thirsted there for water and the people murmured against Moses saying and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of, out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? <clears throat> so it's not, hey, you know, what's the plan? How much how much longer do we need a plan on going without? Can we, can we send out some scouts? It's not that. It's what? What kind of idiots are you? You're going to just kill all our children, all the livestock? What, you don't care the slightest about us trying to find water? It's a scolding and a rebuke. It's criticism. Very disrespectful. Again, you can go without water for several hours. It is very unpleasant. It gets to be very scary, very dicey with your kids pretty quickly. But... These are people who needed to be respectful. Your, your kids and your livestock aren't going to start dying in the next 15 minutes. And they also needed to have faith. That's important right here. The cloudy pillar is above their heads at this very moment. The manna is in their bellies. And it's probably still on their teeth. Right? God is performing miracles every day to care for his people. Do they really think that God is some kind of bumbling fool? Just, yeah, oh, i got to bend over backwards to make sure I get them water. Uh, and get them food. Okay, they got the man. They got the man. Okay, fine. Oh, my God, I forget. Am I forgetting something? Okay, yeah, they had to make sure that the cloudy pillar's there. Okay, you know, and, and God's just a bumbling fool. He's going to forget about it. That's kind of the, the, the attitude here. And it's just like, folks, don't you have faith? Didn't you see that you were supposed to learn some lessons with the hunger? Some people didn't learn them, and they started getting feisty about it, and they got in trouble for it, right? God punished them, I believe. And so this, this is just really sending the wrong message. It's a, it's a sad lack of faith. It's sad to see that um, while the miracles of God are taking place all around them. Verse 4, and Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, what shall I do unto this people? They, they'd be almost ready to stone me. If it gets much worse, these people might actually put me to death. With these emotions and these, you know, excuses of caring for their own, please God help us so we can avoid tragedy here. You know, I think Moses had faith, but he's concerned for his safety. So he's crying out to God, please do something here. And verse 5, the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee the elders of, of Israel, and thy rod wherewith thou slowest the river, take in thine hand and go. And of course, let me just say, um, you know, there was there was rivers, there were streams, there was Elam, we talked about the, the springs there, there was uh, Mirabah. There have been several water sources so far, right? It's not like God sent them out into the wilderness, they got to the Red Sea, you can't drink any water in the Red Sea, right? That's, that's going to be salt water. Um, and, you know, they've just been going without water this whole time. No, we've seen several times they've gotten water already, right? So again, it's that lack of faith that, that's going on right here. Hey, we're thirsty, and we, we need to trust God what you needed to do. Verse 6, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock 
and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, I've actually seen photos of what they believe is this location over in Western Arabia, known as the Split Rock in Horeb. You can just Google that, and you will see pictures of these two big, humongous rocks. If they stood up about right here where I'm standing, they would just about touch the ceiling right here. They're large, high rocks, and there's this just this clear split down. It's about that wide of a gap down, mostly straight. It's not exactly straight, but it's a mostly straight line down this rock. And so if somebody said, hey, the split rock, remember the split rock, right? You would know right away if you've ever been there. You'd be, oh, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about, right? Um, but uh, it's a very flat area, and this rock is very vertical, rises up over the land. So everybody, if Moses was down close to the, you know, the front of this rock, everybody would have been able to see it, right? This has been very visible. And Moses goes over, and he takes that rod in his hand, of course, uh, with which he's done all these wonders. You know, God's broke, spoke the, uh, God parted the Red Sea and such in association with this, uh, this uh, rod that he's got. It's the one that turned into a serpent and so forth. And he hits the rock one time, smites it, he says, one time, and water just starts to gush out of this flint rock. This is actually a flint rock. Everybody understand what a flint rock is? You, you strike it together with itself, and what happens? You get fire. You don't get water, right? So that's part of the extra part of the miracle. You know, it's just like sometimes in the Bible they go out of their way to make sure everybody knows this is a miracle. Nobody can dispute this being a miracle. Like Elijah, I mean, there's a famine going on. There, nobody has water for their crops, right? And he says, I want you to go get 12 barrels of water, and I want you to dump it all over this thing, right? And so that nobody can say, hey, you know, years later, it's like, well, you know, what that was, he, he can figure out, you know, makeshift matches, and he had a mind in the back, and he's just like, you know, like this. No, if you dump 12 barrels of water over it, and you see the whole trench around it is all filling up, right? Obviously, this is a miracle from God, if it all of a sudden burn, all burns up in fire, right? And so, <clears throat> excuse me. That's, that's one reason why I think this is a flint rock, so that nobody can say, well, you know how it is out in the wilderness, you know, sometimes there's a reservoir underneath, and sometimes, you know, there's a well under there, and it's actually under pressure. Sometimes, you know, there's this, under, something under the surface of the ground. No, that, that none of that was happening right here. This is just God performing a miracle, and you could walk around the back of the, back of the rock, and there's nothing there. And in the front of the rock, there's just water gushing out of the front of the rock. And it's not coming out of the ground. It's coming out of the rock. Water doesn't come out of a rock. And so God is performing a miracle here for his people. The people start to get water. They give it to their children. They drink it themselves. They provide water for their livestock. Everybody's taken care of. Everybody's going to live. And, of course, that represents the Son of God. It represents Jesus Christ given to the world to bring us life. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, that they all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Followed them there. Some people speculate it might mean that this water actually went with them as they had to get up and journey from this location and get closer to Mount Sinai and then eventually go to the next place. As they're going north, they got to go toward Kadesh Barnea. Some scholars think that this water followed them. The water was able to keep moving with them and provided for their flocks and provided their herds and provided for their needs constantly throughout uh, the uh, Old Testament. That's likely what was taking place. Jesus also told the woman at the well, what? Whosoever drinketh of this water that I give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The water in this chapter that preserved the life of the people and their children, their livestock, represents Jesus coming into our lives with refreshment and salvation and a better life, life more abundantly. Look at verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So they, they had to stop and say, you know, for, just from lack of water. For this short amount of time, these people literally began to doubt whether the true God was actually with them or not. Now, help me out, folks. Is that ludicrous or what? Here people are praying for the deliverance of God a few months before. Probably the toughest military force from the world. They're delivered from it twice. And miraculously, they defeat that force with a finality at the Red Sea. They watch God give them heat at night and shade in the day. They watch God provide food miraculously for them and all their children. All these miracles are very visual and happening every single day. And they're a few minutes removed from some of them. It's plain as the nose in all their faces that the very true God, the real God, who created heaven and earth is definitely with them and caring 
for their every need and meeting them all. But just a few hours of thirst comes along and all of a sudden it doesn't matter there's a cloud above them taking care of their shade. It doesn't matter all these miracles have taken place to protect them and guide them and care for them. They just mouth off and complain and criticize authority. And they go so far as doubting whether God's actually with them. So this is a message to all of us who also have tons of blessings that are constantly being bestowed upon us as Christians and as Americans. But you still hear people with difficulties from time to time, you know, with, with the difficulty to keep on believing in Jesus Christ. It's very important that we don't get disrespectful toward the Lord with the different difficulties that come in our lives. Again, all over the Bible, we see difficulties make us better. They make us stronger. Tribulation, work of patience. So God just gives us what we need a lot of the time. That's often how he gives us the strength that we need. So this was just God being good to them and building their character and so forth. And they rebel and bring the anger of the Lord upon themselves. It's a bad example that we shouldn't follow. Again, it's called tempting the Lord. Hey, let, let's see how much we can provoke the Lord. Let's see what he's going to do. I bet you he's going to do a thing. Tempting God. So after this, it sounds like Moses, he, he names the place Masa and Meribah. Masa meant temptation. Along with the tempting of the Lord. He didn't want the people to forget the mistake that they made there. They wanted to, he wanted them to learn from their mistake. They named the place Masa. And he also named it Mirabah, meaning strife or chiding. Referring to that critical rebuking of authority. Look at verse 8. The story suddenly changes, uh, shifts gears here. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Kind of seems like it just comes out of nowhere. We're in here in chapter 17. But apparently... Some somewhat local tribes here feel like they might be able to plunder Israel and take spoil since they do have gods of livestock out here, you know, in the wilderness. Now, Amalek was one of the dukes of Eliphaz, the son of Esau. So this is an Edomite tribe. They identify themselves by their ancestor Amalek, just like the Hebrews identify themselves as, you know, Israel, Jacob. And by the way, we know this was a very cowardly and dastardly manner in which the Amalekites fought with Israel in this case. From Moses' recounting of most likely this incident, in Deuteronomy, remember Deuteronomy he goes back through some of the stories and records of things that took place and, and he gives a little more insight, sometimes he gives some commentary on it well in Deuteronomy 25 verses 17 and 18, I'll just read it to you it says, remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the highmost of thee even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary and he feared not God, so they, they wait toward the back and they attack in a very dirty manner, trying to find the people that are either, you know, feeble, the older people, the really young, maybe, people that are trailing behind who they can't keep up. And they try to look for people that are very weary and tired. And they try to wait. They probably would, would lie in wait and watch for times when, oh man, the people have been walking for a long period of time now. Now is it going to help me get time to attack? Because they're tired. But, you know, it takes energy to fight back, right? And so just a very unjust war effort that they go about. Uh, in a very dirty manner. So they go after the weakest and, and try to plunder and they try to take spoil and try to try to steal. And very wicked what Amalek does here. Verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Of course, Joshua was younger. Uh, they have some warning here, so they have time to prepare for battle. Look, we're going to have to deal with this threat. We can't just have him keep on hitting up the feeble and, and beating up on on older folks and, and uh, people that are more vulnerable, we're going to have to go and have a battle and fight these people and, and try to get them off our backs and defeat them. And as you, when you see all, uh, battles in the Old Testament, very often I think there's an application of some sort where you can apply the story to our spiritual worker now in two New Testament times. So one lesson here is preparation for battle. They took, typically took time to count how many men they had. To arrange the troops strategically based on skill and strength and valor and courage, what type of weapons they, they were using, whether it was cavalry, infantry, archery. They organized and planned and prepared. And that's always important, even when God promised to fight for them and give them the victory. So in the New Testament, we organize our soul winning efforts, right? We don't just, you know, oh, why don't we just start knocking just like we did last week? No, no, no. We organize. We figure out, hey, here's where we're going to go uh, for this week. Here's the, here's the doors we're going to knock on. Now, we know that we're going to be victorious. We know we're on the winning side because of faith in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't take away the benefits of having a plan and organizing our efforts to be as productive as possible. 
Moses communicates with Joshua. He tells him to get organized. Hey, handpick the men who can defend us the best. Handpick some strong people, some people you can get ready to fight in just a few hours. Continuing verse 9, he says, Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So there's a hill next to the place where the battle is going to uh, be go, go down, kind of in a valley there. This hill afforded a view of the battle. Moses tells Joshua, hey, I'm going up into that hill, verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But so, so this, this represents a good amount of time going by here. Uh, probably Moses, you know, kind of figured it out again. He's got this rod and holding it up and he's praying and things like that. And pretty soon by experience, he figures out when my hands are up in the air, Israel is just destroying them. And just, you can see in a battle when, when one side is being shut, pushed back, when one side is discomfiting the other side, getting them out of their formation and, and gaining ground and such. And he can sense that and he realizes, oh, God is helping us because my, my hands are in the air. So my hands got to stay in the air, right? Because after a while, his hands get tired, and he has to bring them down for a little bit. He's like, I hope we're, hope we're okay for a little bit. And sure enough, he sees the lion is shoving the other direction. I got to keep my hands in the air. But they're getting so tired, right? Verse 12, but Moses' hands were weary. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So this takes nearly the whole day, depending on when the battle begins. Kind of like it did this morning, probably when this began. And Moses is keeping that hand up. Or again, Amalek starts to win. Amalek starts to push them back and destroy people. Now, obviously, you can't just hold your hands up for hours and hours. We all know when you raise your hand, the blood runs downward, right? Because you've got gravity. And before you know it, you, just, you lose the strength. I can hold my hands up here for probably about, I don't know what, it's going to be six or ten minutes, something like that. And pretty soon it's just like, oh, my goodness, I'm too tired. The blood runs down. You lose the strength to keep your hands in the air. So that happens to Moses. <clears throat> and before long, Aaron, Moses' brother, and another man, presumably another older man, because he's not out there in the battle, right? Just like Aaron and Moses. These two men start to see what's happening. And they watch as the battle is starting to be lost. So they grab the hands of Moses and they start to hold him up in the air. But I'm guessing before long, their arms get tired too. And they start to, well, our arms are tired, your arms, what are we going to do? And so finally they, they said, let's get a little rock so you can sit down. And let's get you lower than us so that we can hold your hands up. But our hands are down now, right? So they're holding his hands up, but their hands are down. The gravity is, you know, the gravity's not doing the same blood thing uh, as, as it was happening with Moses. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I picture him kind of maybe a foot off the ground or so with his torso still upright. Okay, now we can hold up the hands without our hands getting tired. So they hold them up and just hold them up and hold them up for something like five or eight hours. They're holding up Moses' hands and maybe maybe even a bit longer than eight hours. So folks, this was no easy task, okay? This is, this is something I would warn everybody, you know, kids, don't try this at home, okay? <laughs> you know, this... Don't, when your parents go out or something, don't be holding up somebody else's hands for five hours. That's not a good idea. Um, can you imagine how, how asleep Moses' hands were after a while? You know, just like, oh my goodness. Um, sometimes I wake up, this used to be more of a problem um, maybe a year or two ago, but I would often wake up and, and it turns out I was sleeping with my hand like this, I'm on top of my hand, sleeping like that. Well, the first thing that happens when you wake up, you know, oh my goodness, your hands just get all tingly, right? And just horribly tingly fingers and such. But in your hands, that doesn't really last long because it's closer to your to your heart than your, your legs are, right? You know, when your, your, leg, your foot goes to sleep, it can take a long time. It's just like, you know, you're walking around and you look like you're drunk or something, you know, like, oh my goodness, I can barely even walk, right? But uh, th this would have been extreme for, again, five to eight hours like this. Somebody else is holding them up for you. And, you know, again, we don't know how long it took for that blood to get back to brushing in. He's 80 years old at this time, right? And so a tough day for these fellows. But a lot of people think this is a metaphor, of course, for support of the man of God. Moses was a man of God. If he had been alone in this effort here, Israel would likely have been defeated. But he was not. Moses had support. He had somebody to come and help and hold up those hands. Somebody who worked and put forth effort 
alongside the leader. And folks, I can't, I can't uh, overestimate how important that is in a church, in any organization, in any team. I need all the support I can get. A big thank you, of course, for those who I know pray for me uh, when we go out soul winning, when we do different events and such. And people um, go out with me. They go soul winning as well on their own. But they come out with us. They knock on some of the same doors. And they go to some of the same areas with us and, and hold up uh, that, that work to the Lord. Your labor is not in vain the Lord. Amen. But it's things like that, that this story represents. The importance of being somebody who supports and holds up the hands of the leaders and the hands of the men of God. Verse 13, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. That means they were victorious, of course. I've studied the word discomfited uh, some in the past. If I alluded to it, it might mean something like being broken up. You know, the army causing an opposing force to break ranks and lose their effective formation in battle. Verse 14, and the Lord said unto Moses, write this for memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So perhaps this is referring to Deuteronomy. Which gives us the details of the nefarious nature of the Amalekite pact. Of course, uh, this was fulfilled hundreds of years later at the time of Saul. God told Saul, hey, you got to wipe out, just stamp out everybody uh, pertaining to Amalek. And uh, that's a different sermon that we covered at another time. Verse 15, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. This means the Lord is my banner. Verse 16, for he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So Moses builds an altar. He thanks the Lord with burnt offerings, presumably thanking him for the victory. And he commemorates an important name for their God, Jehovah my banner. Because in their day, it was important that the warriors in battle held up their ensigns and their banners as identification because those represented their authorization and the fact that they fought under the king's direction and in his defense. The name Jehovah provided that same identification and authorization. Jehovah is our banner, and Jehovah has sworn he's going to be having war with Amalek, and, and they're never going to resolve the difference, because Amalek's eventually just going to be destroyed. So that's chapter 7, Exodus chapter 17, rather. The journey of the people with this little thirst, which again, is supposed to make people better, make them stronger, and so forth. They get bitter about it instead, and criticize authority. God gives them water from a rock, which represented Jesus Christ. He has a lot of mercy on them. There's an attack that comes from Amalek and Aaron and Hur hold up the hands of Moses. God gives a great victory, and Moses builds an altar, which he names Jehovah our banner. This is a powerful chapter, of course. We should follow the good example there of Aaron and Hur and the people who fought bravely and valiantly for the Lord and avoid the bad example of those who are critical and faithless with authority. We're going to move on now to chapter 18. Chapter 18 is the story of Jethro coming to visit Moses now that the people are allowed in the wilderness and free from the Egypt, and Moses is their leader. There's a lot that we can learn from this chapter. Look at verse 1. When Jethro the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. And just a reminder, the meaning of this word translated father-in-law is, is, I believe, a general term for just in-laws, okay? It's translated sons-in-law in the story of Lot. So this is a generic in-law of Moses. So maybe it's his brother-in-law, probably. A good, good, uh, I think a good possibility. Uh, his actual father-in-law, I think, was Ruel, and he's passed away. But Jethro's priest in his stead. Now we covered all that back in chapters 3 and 4. But of course, Jethro, the in-law of Moses, as he's living out there in, in Moab, in uh, Midian, rather, He's very likely to hear the news, you know, somebody maybe in a roving band or some other relatives he met with or that went to visit him or visit, he visited them. Somebody shares the news. Hey, you know all those Hebrews that were slaves in Egypt? They've all been free. They whooped up Egypt, actually. Rather, their God, Jehovah, whooped them up and did all these ten plagues so, and so forth. He heard all of this news and that God had brought them out of Egypt in a few verses he comes, of course, to meet with Moses. Verse 2, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. Moses had sent her back. And this is a little detail that I guess wasn't deemed all that newsworthy by the Spirit and by Moses back in chapter 8 or so when it happened. But after the incident, on, you know, in the inn on the way, when Moses had a bloody foreskin thrown at him and, and such, and, and his life was in danger at that time. And also, <clears throat> um, you know, you could also consider the safety of Zipporah, you know, if you're an untouchable with an army like that in Egypt and such, and you actually start beating them, right? You are the prophet that brings on all these plagues. Eventually, a prophet that brings on a plague that kills everybody's sons, their, their firstborn son. 
you know, is it safe to have around that guy's wife and his, and his sons? It might be a good idea, right, for them to be somewhere else and be in safety. So one, of those, one or two of those reasons happens here, and Moses just feels like, you know what, let's send Zipporah home. The two sons, the two sons they can go back to, you know, the, the in-law's place and, and be safe there for a while until all of this, you know, drama, so to speak. Uh, wear it down. So probably as a brother-in-law, Jethro doesn't just want to harbor Zipporah. He wants to get her back to her husband, presumably where she belongs, right? And so Jethro also wants to see Moses and see, you know, the, the evidence of his miracle taking place, rejoice in it, right? That Israel has defeated Egypt. So he packs up his things and Moses' wife and their sons and gets them back to be with Moses again in him. Verse 3, verse 3, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for the God of my father said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Now, it might seem a bit funny to throw in the meaning of the son's names right here when you see all the content in chapter 18. But the meaning of Eliezer's name is not given back in chapter 4 like Gershom's was. So if we didn't have it here, we wouldn't have it, right? So it's a good thing that I think to be we have it here. But Gershom, that means stranger, and Eliezer means my God is, my, is a help. Uh, verse 5, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness where he came. Uh, encamped at the mouth of God, uh, at the Mount of God, rather. So it sounds like they've already uh, made it to Mount Sinai. They're encamped there. That maybe that was the meaning of Rephidim back in chapter 17. We'll probably cover more of the significance of that in chapters 19 and 20. Verse 6, and he said unto Moses, I thy father in law, Jethro, and come unto thee and thy and thy wife and her two sons with her. This is probably saying he sent a messenger, and he said, Hey, you know, I'm Jethro, I'm here, right? Verse 7, And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare. And they came into the tent. Now, as you're just reading through that casually, you might think, hold on a second. Moses has been apart with his wife, Zipporah, for two, three, four, five months, something like that. At least two or three months. Maybe more. Why is Moses just, oh, Jethro, hey man, it's so good to see you. You know, his wife is just standing there and kind of ignores her or something like that. You know, <clears throat> hey, how you doing? Won't you come to the tent? Man, there's so much for us to talk about. That's kind of the, the picture that pops into your head here. But what about your wife, Moses? Are you going to say hi to her? Are you going to, hey, I missed you? Are you going to embrace her? You know? And to that I might say, you know, there is the wife's attitude of disrespect that we saw again at the end. Maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe not, you know. It, it, uh, I don't know. The other thing is, this, it just might be the culture that they were in. It's a very male-dominated society. This might sort of been what was expected, that you know he would focus his attention mostly on the male visitor, who's an important guy, right? He's a high priest, I think, or a priest of Midian, at least. And so the, 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 the culture here would be, hey, you're gonna focus attention mostly on him and entertain him. You know, maybe he looked at his wife and winked at her and you know said something quick to her. We don't know for sure, but different culture for sure. But that Jethro is welcomed by Moses. Moses is excited to see him. Moses probably got to know him well and worked with him a lot for about 40 years. They're probably close as well. Some of the men in this culture got a bit closer to male friends and acquaintances than they did to their wives. So that, that's probably, sometimes things just played out that way, right? Verse 8. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and all the travail that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. So he recounts a lot of the toils and difficulties that they've been through and the ways in which the Lord had been taking care of their every need. And Jethro rejoiced, verse 9, for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord, that Jehovah, is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. And we reference this verse showing how the gods of Egypt were targeted in, 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 in definite, with a definiteness. Uh, targeted in the choice of the plagues that Jehovah the Lord brought. The plagues were designed to show what Jethro says here. That Jehovah God is superior to all the little g-gods in Egypt, even in their supposed area of strength. In the Nile, and in the sun, the darkness, and in the area where they dealt proudly, he's actually stronger by far than them, even in that area. Verse 12, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came, and all the elders of Israel, to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law, 
before God. So again, Jethro was a prominent person. He was a priest in Midian, and so they treat him with dignity while he's here, and they want to bring all the, you know, most of the highest ranking Israelites and bring him in and, and have not with him. Verse 13, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? So why sittest thou thyself alone and all the people stand by thee from morning until even? So basically Jethro's just being, he's just there, he's being a fly on the wall as the day goes by and he's observing things. And Moses starts off early in the morning and there's either just this huge line of people to come and see Moses or as the people are satisfied or have their questions answered, there's always more people seeking the audience of Moses. They're just eventually, there's no, there's no break there. And it just goes all the way until sundown. Which this might be the time of the year, about this time of year, right? So the sundown is even later. So just a really long day for Moses. And Jethro, if one, once he finally, you know, he's ragged and he's got hair, you know, flying all over the place and he's sweaty and he's like, I'm so tired. And he gets, and, and, and Jethro says, hey, buddy, what is this thing you're doing where all the people, they're standing here all day and, and all this, verse 15. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. So basically, people may might have a dispute with their fellow, or just questions about how they should live their lives, and what their views should be like, how they should look at things, and what their opinions should be. And Moses, individually, has just been teaching <coughs> that one group, or that one family, or that one individual, the way that they should live according to God, and dealing with any disputes, and, and all of the the arguments that, that pop up along the way. Verse 17. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear, surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee. But this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Basically, he's imagining, you know, imagine sort of the, the Supreme Court is all one person, and this country has about two million people in it. One man, he, he's the only one that you can bring a dispute to or just a question about life. Question about morality, question about a belief system in God or something like that, right? Number one, that's going to be a ridiculously busy guy. And number two, a whole lot of people are just not going to have the leadership and the help that they're, they're going to need and the question and the answers that they're going to desire. The vast majority aren't going to get those, right? So Jethro sees and senses that and he says, look, this is going to burn you out and for no good reason. And most of the people won't get their needs met anyways. This is not a good system you got set up here. And, and, and Moses was new at this. This probably just sort of developed itself. It said that it came to pass. This is kind of the way things played out. Maybe he didn't have a plan or a system set up. And this has probably been going on for a few days at most. Who knows? Maybe Moses would have figured this out on his own, that this was unsustainable. Uh, but it's nice that Je Jethro came along. Maybe God sent Jethro along at just the right time to say, hey, you know something about administration. It's a great word Moses needs to hear right now. But look what Jethro goes on to say. Verse 19, hearken now, listen, hearken unto my, now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel and God shall be with thee. Be thou to the people, for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. And all the people, and all this people shall also go to their place. He, he says here, if thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so. He's acknowledging, look, I'm not your boss, I'm not your authority, okay? All I have is just a suggestion for you. Okay, I can't make you do this. But if God leads you this way, I promise you, this is gonna this is gonna save you a lot of work. You're gonna be able to endure. You're gonna have a nine to five, and you can go home and rest and relax with your wife at the end of the day. If you don't do it this way, you're gonna run ragged, and you're gonna all, you can always be on the clock and always being called, and you can stay up till midnight sometimes, and you're still not gonna get a third of the work done. You're not gonna get a tenth of the work done, right? Verse 24, so Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. So several things here. He says, look, what you, what you really need to do, you need to divide the several different people, divide everybody up into several different groups of people, 
And you need to have several leaders over these different groups. You can, te you can teach the leaders the policies and the ordinances and the way of life that the people need. Teach the laws that God gives you. Any serious, hard issues, the leaders can then bring to you if they can't figure it out. But you can just be the administrator. That is going to make your life much easier. And eventually, God provides the laws that they need over the next several chapters. So you're going to teach everybody to live the way they ought to live. And you'll choose out leaders to bear the burden of leadership and the labor of leadership with you. You just be the administrator. And then he even gives them some qualifications for these leaders. Now, they did already have some leaders. You know, the Bible talks about the elders of Israel all throughout the book of Exodus where we've already been. But here, I think they may have needed even more. And they needed encouragement and support. And if any of them were not actually qualified, they needed to be replaced. We need to make sure that they're, they, they have the qualifications they need. So it goes through some qualifications here. He says, able men. That means men who have skill. Men who could teach and build things and counsel people. Men who are able to do things. Number two, men that fear God. You can't put people in leadership who are going after other gods or just live as though there is no God. They look for men of righteousness and honor. Men who lived right and clearly had the Lord Jehovah as their God. That was number two. Then he says men of truth, so honest men, right? Men who were never deceptive in business, just taking advantage of people. Men who knew and believed the truth. They weren't deceived about a lot of things and, and in error about a lot of things. And then he says hating covetousness. We can't put people in leadership who are greedy and just doing all they can to get rich. In fact, men who, who look, we, we need to find some men who actually can't stand that mentality. Men who hate covetousness. Again, we can't have people who use their influence just to get filthy lucre and gain. Verse 25, and Moses chose out, chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons, the hard cases they brought them to Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. So he makes the adjustment and he fixes the problem. Verse 27, and Moses let his father in law depart and he went his way into his own land. So this is a good passage for conflict resolution. As I said, they fix the problem, and as we continue, we see God blesses them. Again, here we see none of us is strong enough to handle all the problems himself. So I'm so thankful that we have different people who do dream church, all the different Sunday schools that we have. I'm so thankful for my wife's help, for Miss Carolyn, who does most of the organization with the prime timers. We, we have a great team here, people that have skills, people who aren't all covetous and, and just waiting to wait for oh, man. Uh, I think there's a way for me to you know, get into some multi-level marketing. I can convince everybody in the whole church to, to get underneath me and I can get rich. You know, we, we don't have that attitude. We just we have people who love people. We have people who care about others and care about the church as a whole. Um, it's great to work with the great people that we have here at the Cater Baptist, and I appreciate you so much. So Spower has a network of prayer. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you. Um, that uh, we get to have these examples here in your word all built in a fun story an interesting story um, something that uh, is delightful and, and uh, keeps our attention but in, at the same time we catch the truth we catch the truth that there's these good examples and we try to follow them and we can't do it on our own i i can't do everything in the church that needs done i can't reach the whole area for christ on my own we all jump in together and we're a team and as a team um, we can accomplish so much more for Christ. Thank you that you got 12, 12 disciples. You taught them all. You, they, were, they were disciplined ones. You taught them discipline. You taught them how to reach people for Christ. And then you sent them out all throughout the world, and they gathered up. What did Paul do? He gathered up a company. And it talks about an Acts. The Paul, Paul and his company. And uh, he didn't just go out by himself. And so many of them, they got together. They coordinated their efforts. They were a team. And we see the result of it today. There's millions and millions of people who believe in Jesus Christ and love you. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to, to get that team mentality and to take these good examples and apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand, shall we? We're going to sing a song here, number 349. 349. Trust and obey. Let's do the first and the last verse here.
sure appreciate you being here and faithful tonight. What time did we get started with the Roman sale on Thursday? Mention that. Is that not important? We don't know yet. All right, we're going to put it on Facebook as soon as we find out, all right? Stay tuned. But we'll let you know on Wednesday night as well. All right, let's see here. Brother uh, Billy Oho, why don't you pray and ask the Lord to bless you, Father, thank you for this word. 